I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Thank you. Approval of the December school board minutes. Someone? Thank you, Elaine. I move that we uh, accept uh, December's uh, school board minutes as posted in our packet. A second. A second. Any discussion or comment? All in favor? 7-0. And now for our high school student representatives. Good evening, gentlemen. Start us off tonight talking about construction that's been going on. Uh, pretty much finished up when the floors around the bathrooms and stuff. So now mostly down in the cafeteria. Gym is also complete. Floor's real nice, real nice. Um, as far as the cafeteria goes, the ceiling is still partially gone. They're installing some sort of ventilation system. And they're also adding onto the side of it to make more room for, I guess, future classes. It seems to be going pretty well. Nothing's really getting in the way. Um, also, the theater has just started up rehearsals for the one act of Lily's Purple Plastic Purse, which we'll be taking to Falmouth for the one act festival later on in February or March. All right, um, winter sports are underway at the high school. Um, all of our sports have been doing really well so far. Hockey obviously always does well. Uh, they won't beat South Portland Monday night, which is pretty big. Uh, basketball team's been doing really well, enjoying their new floor, the new gym. Um, track just started off. We had our first meet. I'm on the track team. We had our first meet Friday night. Uh, that's been going well. and. Uh, in the SAC, uh, some of the specific classes have been um, doing fundraisers and gathering money for uh, tsunami relief funds, which I thought was a nice idea. And uh, other than that, things are kind of chaotic for some students right now. It's the last week before midterms. All the students are getting, all the teachers are getting their last test of the semester in there. So a lot of studying going on, but it's going pretty well. Great. Any questions, comments? Good luck on your midterms. Thank, Thank you. you and good luck, yes. You know, a middle school student, it looks like. How are you tonight? Good, how are you? Good. Um, I just want to start by saying Happy New Year to everyone. Even though there's only been three weeks of school since, our last, since we last met, there is still a lot to report. In student council, we delivered our gifts for adoptive family. There's a fifth and sixth grade rollerblading social coming up next Tuesday and Wednesday. There will be a dance for the seventh and eighth graders at the beginning of February. In eighth grade news, all Spanish students in eighth grade will be taking the high school placement test this Thursday and Friday. Also, Ms. Diana and Mrs. Dana selected six students from each of their classes to take the national Spanish exam on February 17th. This gives these students a chance to see how they compare to other Spanish students across the nation. Mr. Price's advisory had a great idea to raise money for the tsunami relief. Posters were hung all around the school explaining the project. On Friday, the 7th of January, everyone would be allowed to wear a hat in school if you paid $1. By Thursday, the elementary school had heard about the idea and wanted to join in. On Friday, Mr. Price's advisees collect $1 from each person. The total amount of money raised was $1,317, all going to the tsunami victims. The whole school is very proud of this accomplishment. Winter sports are going very well. The Nordic ski team has their first race on Thursday. The girls basketball team had their last game yesterday, and the boys teams will start soon. In entertainment news, the variety show is coming up at the be very beginning of February, and the play is also underway. All auditions are over, and the callback list was posted today. Any questions? Great job. Thank you. Thanks. On to communications. Bob has a notification of a teacher retirement. 
Uh, yes, in the school board package was a letter from uh, Jackie Petrillo announcing that she would be retiring this year. Jackie's been with us many years, and, and many of you probably know her or, or kids have had her, and uh, um, we will miss her, but uh, we're happy for her as well. And uh, we'll be talking more about that as the year continues toward, toward its end. Um, the, um, I have one other piece here, and that's the, uh, um, there's an ongoing discussion on project graduation and insurance. Um, we have never, the issue has never come to the school be board before that I can find. Um, and there is an issue of having to pay for an insurance voucher for that evening if it is not covered under the school board. Jeff tells me that in checking around with other schools, Yarmouth, for example, covers it. The school board recognizes project graduation, and therefore it's covered under their policy. Um, but they also, the you know, students and and uh, parents who are working on it must follow the same follow school committee rules, so must get approval for trips and all of that kind of thing. Um, uh, I don't think there would be a problem with that as long as. Uh, um, at least in the future, they were close enough that uh, if there were a problem, somebody could go and pick somebody up. Um, but we may want to consider that option because I think it's a realistic option. It's, it is the Freeport High School seniors, um, even though they are no longer seniors the last night, the night of the major event, um, they are graduates, but um, it certainly can be covered and I don't see putting out there another expense if it's not necessary. Um, we will look at it further and try to bring something back for your, you know, uh, for your decision at our next monthly meeting. Um, but just keep you updated on it. The other item that was under communications, Kevin, was the reflections on the workshop of the town council. And that was an open agenda for anybody to comment. So I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, um, for the public's information, was it last week? Mm -hmm. Last week, uh, we had a dinner meeting with the town council to open budget season. Um, and this is an opportunity for each board member or no board member to express their thoughts on that meeting. Um, no one is compelled to say anything. And to make it easy for us, I think I'd like to start from left to right. If anyone would care to pass, just please say so. Henry, would you like to begin? I'd like to pass, please. Brings it to me. Um, I'll, I'll just be brief and say that I thought that it was uh, good that we shared a lot of information between ourselves and the town council. They shared some of their um, initial information and we shared some of ours. It's going to be a tough budget season. Um, I know we've heard that before. I think that. This is no exception, maybe exceptionally exceptional, but it's going to be very tough. But that's uh, basically what I took out of it. Trish? Um, I would echo a lot of Kathy's comments. I, it, it was my first time around, so it was very informational. Um, I guess my, and I appreciate the town council um, meeting with us and giving us the opportunity to learn from them. I guess my, um, there was so much information that was prevented, a lot of it legislative. I, I guess my only um, suggestion, I guess, for future, if it was more of a working session, perhaps, or I would have enjoyed more of a working session where we sat together and compared notes and then said, okay, how are we going to address this as opposed to sort of just a, it, some of it was presentation. There were legislatures there, which were great. that gave us an update on the tax reform issues, but it sort of, it, for me anyway, the first time around sort of, mishmashed those two topics and they were very different topics so on the whole i think it was positive um, particularly for me as a new member i guess i would have liked to maybe have done it even as maybe a month earlier per se where it was actually more of a, a working session but i do thank the town council for um inviting us to meet with them i guess the one message that i'd like to give me is um while the school board and the town council are certainly the stewards of the financial health of our organizations and our town, the way for us to really do a good job with that is to get community input. 
um, I think we all recognize that in this era of diminishing resources, there are going to be very real competing needs, valid competing needs. And um, as we move forward, there could in fact be some really tough decisions if we are in fact going to be held to the cap that the town council set several months ago without any community input and without any pre-discussions with the school board. Um, if we are going to be held to that, there are going to be some very tough decisions. And I would just like to implore the community to please voice your opinions. Um, let us know what your priorities are. Let us know what your thoughts are. Either email us and the town council. Come to the public hearings that are going to be held on the 24th. Um, be proactive and let us know now what choices you'd like to see made rather than reacting in May when it will be too late to have any kind of impact. Rebecca? Well, now we're going to work towards the center. <laughs> I exercise my prerogative to speak oh, last. Sorry. You, you caught me off guard. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, well, yeah, it was a information-packed evening. Um, it, I thought it was really great that our legislators could be there. While it definitely muddied the water for me, I thought it's absolutely essential for both the town council, school board, and the, the community at large to understand that decisions that are going to be made in Augusta soon are going to have significant impacts as to how we conduct business here at the local level. Um, and I hope that we're going to have some of that information in The View, which is the school publication that should be coming out this month. And I urge everybody to read it and inform themselves as much as possible, not just through The View, but hopefully through other local papers, including the current, the Courier, Century, Forecaster, Press Herald, etc. cetera. Um, there's a lot going on at the state level, there's a lot going on at the federal level, and it's all impacting on our work significantly. Um, and I feel, uh, as my first year on the school board, it could not possibly be more stressful. <laughs> um, I feel like the schools are being asked to do more and more every year as a result of state and federal mandates. And increases to our budgets are not keeping up with these demands. Um, and our schools are being stretched thinner and thinner every year. So um, I urge people who are interested in the schools and their future to educate yourselves and then come to the public forums, come to our meetings, and really participate. Elaine? Um, I have to say that um, this will be my fifth year of being a part of the budget process uh, and uh, all five years the procedure has been pretty much the same. I, I think it's always good when the two groups get together and we start off by sharing our concerns, but now we really need to get to meet to work together, as Trish says, so that we develop both the budgets at the same time with the same long-term goals, um, so that we can deliver the services and the school programs that our citizens want and are willing to, to fund. I have to say that I was um, disappointed that the school board was not included in the town council decision to cap expenditure crease increases to the CPI. I would have hoped that we had been allowed to give input, whether it be the facts, like the, our negotiated salary and benefit increases, or whether it be an opinion as to why we might believe that the CPI is not a good indicator for determining school budgets, just from the very fact that goods and services um, is, has a very minimal bearing to our budget that is salary and benefit driven. Separate from the fact that the school board was not invited to participate in this cap uh, that we will have for the next three years, I really think there should have been a, a public hearing to allow the citizens to speak to what types of increases or special circumstances they feel might be reasonable when we develop a budget and maintain the local control that I think this community voted for back in November when they turned down the Pulaski Initiative. 
but the upside of the meeting um, is that we are moving towards working together, um, you know, as, as we're all hoping to do. And I think that three came, things came out of working together. One is that for the first time we are going to have this public forum on the 24th where before we get started we'll be looking for input from the citizens and as everyone said, we hope that a lot of people do come out. Um, the second thing came is that we that came about from this meeting is that they have agreed to have a joint meeting with our finance committee um, to set which CPI uh, may be incorporated into the cap so that we may have an opportunity to give some input there. And lastly, um, there was a promise for a further discussion regarding uh, essential program and service components um, and accompanying monies that we might be getting from the state um, that they may go back into the school budget um, because of the legislative requirements. And it's a little confusing to explain, but there's a little bit of opportunity so that perhaps the two groups can reach some sort of agreement um, as we go forth, and I think that's a good sign. Bob, is there anything you'd like to add? No. I, um, as a first-time participant, it was nice to uh, get together with everybody and sort of get a feel of where they were to get started. Um, but we have a long way to go, and uh, I think we have a lot of work to do. Um, Mr. Chairman, before you give your, may I rescind my pass? You certainly may, Henry. Thank you. Uh, we did get one point cleared at the meeting. Uh, on May 9th, the Town Council and School Board are going to meet, and that's when the public, the formal public hearing for the budget takes place. And normally, we have the public hearing, and immediately the Town Council then adopts the budget without taking into consideration anything that comes up at the public hearing. So we did get the point across that we will have the public hearing on May 9th, and they will have the budget adoption at some other date, whether they have it the next day or what, but the, uh, the finance chairman of the council did agree to that, and uh, at least we got something accomplished. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Henry. And finally, as, as you may or may not recall, in the midst of uh, uh, the tax cap issue, the statewide tax cap issue last year, our town council adopted a two-part resolution, or actually two resolutions. The first was a resolution pledging the individual councilors to, um, <coughs> to a cap equivalent to a C, uh, the consumer price index. And the second was that any money increase in state um, aid to the Cape Elizabeth School District that was directly attributable to the adoption of question 1A was pledged to be returned to the taxpayer. Um, that is, at the face of it, 286000 this year and $201,000 next year. Quite frankly, I acknowledge both the cap and the pledge. However, I also suggested that, not suggested, but said very directly, that we would in fact represent the interests of our constituents, which is the school community. Um, to give you an example of the dilemma that's presented to us, when we take simply salaries and benefits and a number of other items that we absolutely know must come to pass in this budget, our, our budget requirement is already, is it 4.2 or 4.6? 4.6, I believe. Yeah, 4.6 percent. And uh, I go to that extent because tenths of a percent are important. Well, if our cap is 3.2 percent, we are already 1 percent over the expansion in the budget. And in order to meet such a cap, we would have to consider such items as reducing salaries and benefits, increasing class sizes, reducing elective offerings, reducing the number of offerings in core curriculum, um, combining honors and um, AP classes, um, perhaps lowering graduation requirements. This is our dilemma. So I again say, say to you and repeat the invitation that my colleagues have made is we need you out there to help us make these decisions come January 24th. Thank you. 
the next item on our agenda. Um, comments from the public on non-agenda items. Do we have anyone here to comment on a non-agenda item? Seeing none, we are going to move on to recognition. Bob, Shall I? Um, we actually have recognition this evening for each of the three schools in the, in the uh, Cape Elizabeth system. Um, and this recognition comes from the Commissioner of Education for the State of Maine, uh, Susan Gendron. I'll read one of the letters um, and let and let the uh, um, the others speak for themselves. But basically, um, the letter was to the superintendent. An important aspect of the No Child Left Behind Act is the recognition of schools achieving consistently high performance in reading and math. Recognition for these schools is based on Maine's learning results performance standards. Consistently high performing schools have maintained average student performance over the past three years at or above the following levels. In reading, 70% of the students were at the meets or exceeds the standard level. And in math, 50% of the students at, were at the meets or exceeds the standard level. It is with great pleasure that we recognize each of the schools in the Cape Elizabeth system um, for, for being one of these schools. And enclosed is a certificate of achievement um, which you may display with pride at your school. Congratulations to your entire school community for a job well done. Signed, Susan A. Gendron, Commissioner. We'll be doing this with the principals. Yeah. And um, we are going to ask the principals to come forward to receive the certificates for their school um, and to please share with your faculties um, and all of your staff members um, our thanks for their work because this doesn't happen all by itself. It happens by a lot of work from all the faculty members. And um, Kevin, go right ahead. I think we'll uh, speak to Cape Elizabeth High School first. Jeff Shedd, come on up. We have recognition in uh, Cape Elizabeth High School in recognition of your consistently high performance in grade 11 reading and in recognition of consistently high performance in grade 11 mathematics. Jeff, please express our appreciation to the faculty and staff of the high school. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Nancy. For the Cape Elizabeth Middle School, in recognition of your consistently high performance in grade 8 reading, Nancy, again, please extend my congratulations to the faculty and staff and for yourself as well. Certainly. Thank you. And while Kevin is uh, sorting out the other two, I'll just mention that uh, Cape Elizabeth Middle School was above the standard in mathematics also this year, but um, was not for the three-year period and is working to get back there. And finally, Tom, for Pine Cove Elementary School, in recognition of your consistently high performance in grade four reading and grade four mathematics, my congratulations to you, your faculty and staff, Tom. Thank, thank you. you. I'd like to take the opportunity and I'm particularly pleased by the certificates for reading. As the administrators here know that that's a, uh, a big personal issue of mine. But I would also like to remind us that as well as we have done on a very general basis, we still have students that are not meeting the standards. They are our focus as we move forward into this budget season, and it will be through them that our success is, is measured as we move forward. Thank you again. Great job. You'll notice there's no juice and cookies today. <laughs> uh, the next item on the agenda, number eight, is the superintendent's report. 
update on building construction and renovation projects? Uh, yes. Um, for those who were present at the, uh, the workshop um, with the town council, uh, Elaine did a great job of sort of updating them. But for the public at large, let me um, start first with Pond Cove addition. Um, we have completed the punch list at Pond Cove at this point. A punch list is a list of everything that still needs to be done when you get down to the final um, scratches on the wall and uh, dings that have to be patched up and whatever. And uh, the different trades are coming in to finish those up at this point. Um, we have scheduled um, the kindergartners to begin school at Pond Cove, which will be the first time in, I think, about 10 or 11 years. Um, but I don't know if I'm exactly right on that, that time period. Oh. 12 years. Um, on February 7th, a Monday, and we are scheduling an open house to be held um, for all of the townspeople to be able to see that facility on Sunday, February 13th, from 1 to 3 in the afternoon, um, with the ceremony happening about halfway through about 2 o'clock. So um, we will be getting invitations out and notices up about that, but we are that far along. Um, the construction crew is moving out at this point, and we are beginning to move furniture and shelving and those kinds of things in. So um, it's nice to be at that point with that project. Um, the uh, high school construction, I think uh, the high school representative, uh, student representative, um, started for us. Um, they uh, now have the steel erected and the roof on, the addition for the uh, cafeteria. Um, for those people who are over there voting today, you saw that outside piece. That will now begin to be closed in and um, with a breakthrough expected to the existing cafeteria sometime between February vacation and early March um, and the completion of the cafeteria in March. Uh, the, the gym, as you know, is done uh, or for all effects done and is being used uh, tonight for a basketball game against Greeley. Um, the locker rooms, we are expecting to be come online, um, hopefully by um, mid-February, Jeff? That's the optimistic, That's the optimistic <laughs> view, okay. Um, uh, tile is uh, what sort of hold, had been holding that up, and uh, um, they are um, getting ready to get in there because uh, the cement work is, is moving along quite well at this point. Um, the upstairs classroom, several classrooms on the second floor, including the library, have been, uh, the renovations are, are either completed or are well along, and um, it will be as soon as the kindergartners move out in February um, that we will start to see work on the front entrance area, that entire area that is the, um, the office complex, the guidance complex, the math classrooms, and all of the classrooms that have been kindergarten rooms being redone and uh, brought onto in line for, uh, with renovations. Um, and that doesn't, you know, we, we will not at that point have even touched the things that are need to be done over the summer. Um, things like um, putting a sprinkler system in the entire building. And that's much easier to do when the building's empty than it is to start while, while students are in there. So those kinds of things. Um, if you've seen work going on out back, they are working on the, uh, the lower field, the lower soccer field. Um, that is expected to be completed by June or so of ne this coming year. Uh, then we'll have to stay off it for over a year until the fall of 2006 to, uh, to let the grass take well. Um, so it's a long-term project and we know that, um, but it's coming along quite well. So that's a, a, a brief update. A couple of other pieces. I did mention the Pond Cove open house, but I'll mention it separately. Sunday, February 13th from 1 to 3. Um, with a ceremony around two and we will get notices out. Um, we have been notified by the state of receiving our, the preliminary figure says we will receive approximately 280,000 more next year uh, than we did this. Um, we're trying to clarify what of that is regular funding, which will go back to the taxpayers, and what is for special projects like the laptops and learning results that um, 
um, will need to be used in the work that the state is requiring of us. The um, uh, town council public forums have been mentioned, but I'll mention them again. January 24th, there are two, one at 3 o'clock and one at 7.30 right here in these chambers. Um, it's a chance to let the council and the school board know what you want and, and don't want in the budget for the upcoming year. Um, so we urge people to come out to that. And uh, we will be needing a meeting of the co-curricular committee. Um, and I'll talk with Kevin about setting that up because we have, as the budget requests are beginning to come in, we're getting some of those and we need to sit down and discuss um, where we are on those. And I can't remember who else is on that committee, but we'll, uh, we'll check it out. And that's it, unless there are questions. Questions, anyone? Seeing none, it's time for school reports. And we're going to be beginning tonight with the middle school. I believe we have a report on a fifth grade study unit on Acadia. Good evening. My name is Suzanne Janelle, and I teach French at the middle school and at Pond Cove. Uh, Nancy Hutton asked Cheryl Higgins and me to share with you an integrated unit that was developed for grade five. The week before winter vacation, the teachers and students suspended their regular studies and spent two and a half days learning about French Acadians who settled Nova Scotia in the early 1600s. 2004 marked the 400th anniversary of the first French settlement in the New World on Ile Sainte Croix at the mouth of the Sainte Croix River between Calais and St. Andrews, New Brunswick. To prepare the students before the unit began, Lisa Leonard and I used our French time to give the students a historical background. Since my ancestors were Acadian, I shared my family's story with the students and used it as a teaching tool. Each of the teachers on the fifth grade team prepared a learning activity dealing with a different aspect of Acadian life. Students rotated through each activity, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday morning. In Mr. Earle's class, students explored a time capsule of artifacts from the 1600s. In Mrs. Conley's room, students participated in a role play about the deportation of the Acadians in 1750. With Mrs. Welch, students acted out the story of Evangeline from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's epic poem. Mrs. Higgins' activity dealt with the dikes the Acadians built to <coughs> extend their farmland into the marshes. In Mrs. Joyce's class, students discussed everyday life crops, and food sources in the 1600s. In Mr. Solander's class, students made and ate Acadian buckwheat pancakes called ploy. Mrs. Crabtree's activity dealt with a novel about a young boy from Boston who went to live with his Acadian cousins. Mrs. Walsh's students made an Acadian flag and worked on vocabulary puzzles. And when students came to me, we read an Acadian folk tale, and we acted it out in French. We ended the unit on Wednesday morning with a demonstration of the yarn-making process. The students had learned an Acadian folk song dealing with sheep and wool. And so we invited Joan Rolfe, who raises sheep and spins her own yarn, to come and give us a demonstration. Uh, I'll let Cheryl Higgins talk to you a bit more about the unit and um, tell you how the students received it. Thank you. Integrated units in the, in the fifth grade are not new. We've been doing them for about five or six years now, and our topics have ranged from recycling to uh, Peru and the Dominican Republic. Um, we usually do two a year, one in the, week, in the days right before the, the winter break, and then also during March when we have um, the CATS testing in the morning. 
We just we talk about this at the beginning of the year when we come back after a summer break, and we just we look at the calendar and we decide if the calendar lends itself um, to the, a, a few days for us to have uh, an integrated unit. Um, and then we look at topics. This year, we, the t three days before the winter break seemed ideal. And we had already heard on, on the welcome back activities about Suzanne's wonderful trip this summer to Nova Scotia. And it just was amazing how well it fit. Not only it allowing us for the first time to really coordinate things with world language, but to pick up several strands that occur in our social studies program. Um, which, being a social studies teacher, I absolutely loved. Um, the moment, so the moment Arcadia was mentioned as a possible topic, we all went, oh, yes. Part of the reason for that is working with Suzanne is amazing. Um, Suzanne just does an absolutely incredible job. She had brought back resources. She, she suggested topics. Um, she helped each one of us plan the lesson, and it's, it's pure pleasure to work with her. She's just fantastic. Um, as we worked on a unit, it was indeed amazing to see how well it fit with social studies. We deal with Samuel Champlain's exploration of, of New France, um, setting up a, a settlement and how it differs from new settlements in New Spain and New England. Um, the plight of the Acadians also co connected directly to French-British conflict that developed um, over the years and eventually lead to the French Indian War. So the topic really was a perfect choice. Um, the actual unit evolved, as they always do, as teachers choose topic, again with Suzanne's guidance, and try to balance what other people are doing. We always try to include some map work, some history, literature, science, um, a craft, if possible, and the inevitable food. Um, we wanted to open and close the unit with full team activities, which we always do. Uh, this year it was a video, as Suzanne mentioned, for opening, and then the closing was absolutely marvelous with a speaker who, who brought in samples of wool that she had sheared, which is very interesting. The boys would not touch, but the because it was smelled, but the girls were happy to take her and, and manipulate. Um, it, it was just a wonderful session. Um, the students were able to perform a French song, which uh, both Suzanne and Lisa Leonard, our other French teacher, had taught them in the weeks leading up to the unit. Um, and we also had students fill out evaluations so that I can stand up here and rave about what I feel is the success of this unit, perhaps one of the best, if not the best, we've done. But I'd like to share some words of the students. One student enthused in capital letters with a whole line of exclamation marks. Coming to school on Monday, I was excited, and then we started. The unit was awesome. Another wrote, for once, I actually understood something about the past and what it was like. There were also insightful comments asking that next time we do this, we include not just the French side of it, but the British, which had not occurred to us. So it was wonderful to get that input from students. Um, as we planned this unit, we received support, as we always do, from our administration. And we also had a small grant for the Middle School Parents Association, which allowed us to purchase the books, which we read to our class beforehand. Um, food um, and pay our, our guest speakers, so we really appreciate the support we received from the administration and the MSPA. Are there any questions? Can I make a comment? Yes, you can. I am fortunate to have had a child participate, um, and I, when I told her that it was going to be the, on the agenda, I didn't quite, I was not as organized as you, Mrs. Higgins, to write down her quotes, but she spouted off with enthusiasm everything that she participated in and was able to recall many of the facts. So not only was it enjoyable, it was, um, sh it was a success from an educational standpoint. And I guess on top of that, I wanted to thank you because I think in spite of all the demands and pressures that we've alluded to, the fifth grade teaching team took time to coordinate and do something that appealed to kids in, a, in different learning who learn differently and, and presented the information differently. And I know that took some extra time and coordination. So thank you. You did a great job. 
I would just like to also say thanks for those of you who came out tonight to present this because in and of itself that's a wonderful contribution for us and for the people who are watching the meeting at home. But I mean your enthusiasm just comes through in your presentation so I'm sure that that was certainly transferred to the kids and I think we're really lucky to have you doing that kind of program in our school so thanks. Um, ditto as well as to say it's nice to see you again. All right, the next report is, uh, puts Tom Eismeyer on the spot with the Pond Cove report. Um, good evening. I just wanted to add my uh, congratulations to all three schools and the uh, entire community for uh, gaining that recognition from Augusta. We're consistently high performing because I think we respond to the expectations and the support of all of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, continuing the recognition theme, I wanted to thank, particularly thank two members of the technology department last week. Gary Lenoy and Ginger Raspeller came and met with each teaching team during their joint planning time last Tuesday to walk them through the new PowerSchool version of the report card. It's now available to teachers on the internet and Gary and Ginger held hands and led people through. It's a big breakthrough, not just in content, for, but for accessibility for our professional staff. So. They deserve credit. Um, coincidentally, following up on Kevin's remark about uh, ha having uh, support and encouragement for all kids to meet the standards, I had chosen for a topic tonight an update on our teacher assistance team, or TAT. We started, those of, us, those of you who have been on the board for a while, about eight years ago, kind of an ad hoc committee of volunteers who uh, began to meet regularly to respond to teachers' requests about kids who were maybe not doing too well, or in some cases doing extremely well in class, and how would we modify curriculum instruction to meet their needs. Over the years, we formalized it a little bit, and now we have a standing committee that includes the principal, uh, the new teacher leader, Kelly Hassan, um, our social worker, Pam Vos, school counselor, Cindy Perkins, three literacy teachers who rotate membership <coughs> depending on which child is being discussed, Suzanne Hamilton, Deborah Jordan Pearson, and Becky Swift. Ellen Brady, our instructional support teacher. Paula Harris, our nurse. And our two OTPT uh, people, occupational therapist, physical therapist, Christine Freve and Maureen Messer. That's a very diverse group, as you notice. They come from all walks of professional life at Pond Cove. And the cycle we use, each school has a little different uh, way of supporting uh, its TAT or SAT as we. Uh, a teacher makes or a parent makes a request uh, and we meet for about 20 minutes to identify a problem or sometimes it's a very good problem doing extremely well in math. We brainstorm, identify problems at the end of about 20 minutes. We meet on Thursday mornings. We have a plan in place to try interventions, instructional strategies, uh, which we then follow up on. Uh, you know, within a month or two, we usually have a follow-up meeting. And um, by and large, we've been very successful for that. The other duties that have fallen upon this TAT is we now use that as a forum for discussing retention, which is eventually an administrative decision, but it's nice to have input from all parties. And with LAS becoming more and uh, more, uh, the deadline's approaching more every day, it's also a clearinghouse for making any modifications on the MEA or the local assessment system. You'll also notice, too, that we have members of the team who are on pupil services team or special education. And over the years, Claire and I have talked a lot about tapping on those people's expertise. So they uh, contribute their, not just their knowledge and experience, but they're also available to consult and observe, uh, usually with a whole classroom, and make some suggestions to the teacher and the team. We also encourage teachers when they come in the fall to hook up with uh, previous year's teachers so we have some continuity in what's working and not working for these kids. And we've built up a little kind of institutional history with this. We periodically survey the staff and go through, go through the minutes to see what kinds of problems, good and bad, we're dealing with and what kind of topics should maybe we should present at a faculty meeting or an in-service day so that teachers can uh, share the knowledge that we've been developing at TAT. Um, we ha also have, over the years, identified high priority needs. Not too many years ago, uh, again, this is a volunteer group, we did not have the, the professional support 
in the school in order to do the instructional interventions. But five or six years ago, when we targeted that need uh, through your support, we were able to add that instructional support position, Ellen Brady, to respond to a direct need to help kids in math. She also helps now with helping kids stay organized. We're finding that as a, as a big theme. As I said, we, we go through periodically. I took the opportunity to look at the past uh, year and a half of TAT. Last year, for example, we met and discussed uh, 44 kids out of 650. Uh, we met more than that because of follow-ups. And the next part is really interesting. Roger Rio at the high school would really like this. 44 kids, 32 boys. We discussed 12 girls. It's nice to see that the requests were dispersed. We usually, since uh, kindergarten is half day, we uh, would go down and meet and talk about almost batches of kids and intervene directly. The uh, kids were distributed almost evenly among grades one, two, and three, but by grade four, we must be getting a little better at it, the requests were declining because we had uh, interventions in place. Out of the subject matters we did, the categories I found by lumping together, about almost half were academic. What can we do to support kids further in math and reading? <coughs> we had about 10 kids who needed behavior plans. We're finding that kids' ability to pay attention is becoming an issue, and we're developing strategy for that. A rather new one, one that we did not discuss six or seven years ago, was anxiety. Students' anxieties about coming to school or being in school. And uh, we also dealt directly with three students who had transferred from another school and who needed some orientation to uh, the curriculum at Pond Co, particularly in everyday math. Um, this year it's about the same. We're about halfway through the year. We've already met and discussed about 24 kids and the ratio of boys to girls is about the same. 17 boys, seven girls. Um, the, the proportions are about the same, more in the lower grades and uh, in grade four it's a follow-up. Uh, the one I'm really paying attention to now is we've already had uh, three discussions about uh, school anxiety and we're halfway through the year and it's kind of a new theme that we're looking at. Um, new ones this year, we, we've had two meetings about LAS accommodations. We have followed up, and uh, Claire is aware of this, uh, of children who do not qualify for special ed services after a referral and evaluation usually come to the attention of the teacher assistance team. So we use the data that's been generated through a very formal special ed process and see what we can do in the classroom. Um, we have had some concerns about OT issues and they come directly to TAT. We've gotten the advice from our two professionals, been able to deal with that, and the same thing for speech and language. Uh, one further thing I wanted to mention is that by the end of the year, we do have some data on what's working and not working for not just the uh, fourth graders who have been to TAT, but some others. And over the years, we have met first informally and then more formally with the middle school to explain what's coming next, what's worked, what happened. Uh, what we think might work in the fifth grade. And on our part, we think we could do a better job with Nancy and John and their SAT about being more specific about um, the interventions we've done, show the middle school the plans that we've done, things like that. I think we've, we have more responsibility in that area. So overall, I think the, the credit really should go to this volunteer group. They've just done a terrific job with it, and I think they're going full steam ahead. Um, one further thing, um, next month Kelly Hassan will be here to give you a formal update on the uh, new directions for the writing program. And in anticipation of that, some of you may recall that we did a walkthrough through all three buildings a few years ago to check on climate. We're going to do what we call an instructional walkthrough on Friday. We have 11 Pond Co faculty members and Sarah Simmons, so that makes 12 of us, who are going to do a quick observation of writing at Pond Cove on Friday, January 14th, according to the expectations that we agreed on this year and formalized at a faculty meeting. So we're gonna visit each class and take a look at the general atmosphere, about the routines, about the interactions of the kids with the teachers and the kids, and, uh, um, and then we hope, in a non-judgmental way, get this data together and feed it back to the faculty next week at our faculty meeting. And a word to any kids who may be watching, I'm sorry I kicked you off the snow for it, but it was very dangerous, extremely <laughs> dangerous, very icy. I don't think that would pass muster with our lawyers. They were quite upset with me today. 
And if you want a snow day tomorrow, pajamas inside out. That's the only way to do it. <laughs> Any questions? Questions or comments for Tom? I have a question. Um, you said about half of the um, chat reviews were academic. Was there um, any sense of breakdown in, t in um, curriculum area? Was it reading, math, science? It, it's, it's mostly math, a lot as, um, uh, that Al Ellen sees, because with the three reading teachers, we're usually helping the teachers fine tune it more. There has been, though, a notable drop off in requests for strategies to help kids get started with writing this year. It used to be, and you can see it's boy dominated, um, teachers would come to TAT and say, this child won't start writing, won't start writing. We've had none of that this year. The only thing that's come up is that might be a boy. The boy might be having trouble with handwriting to get started writing. So I think the new writing resources and instructional techniques have incorporated more kids. Did, just to follow up, um, since most or a significant number of them were math, um, do you have any plans in the future to maybe do a walkthrough um, on a day of math instead of I'd, I'd love to, yeah. yeah. And so it seems, it seems that we're doing really well in the reading yeah. area, that maybe the next thing to focus on would be math. In, in fact, I think we're, we're using the, the writing cycle. Um, we're, we're basing that almost on math. We should see third, certain things going on in everyday math in each class and see if there's a good match there. Well, that's idea. part of the writing cycles yeah. in math. Yeah, I, I should say, too, that I, I neglected to mention this. The fact that the Pond Cove teachers are willing to participate in a walkthrough like that shows me that the doors are coming down. They're willing to talk to each other and learn from each other professionally. And I think they deserve a lot of credit for that. All set? Thank you, Tom. Yep. So. The next item was committee reports, and we'll begin with Kathy with the Finance Committee report. The Finance uh, Subcommittee met this evening at 6.30 prior to this meeting, where we signed warrants and reviewed appropriation reports. Uh, I also reported on the Food Service Task Force, which met last week, and reviewed the negative student balances. In November, uh, they were 6608, 6608 dollars. In December, they actually increased to $7,087. So we lost some ground in December. Um, I'm not sure why. Um, some, there was some speculation that it may have had to do with the holidays. The, um, there is a group of people who we um, mostly have moved out of town, who we've attempted to reach on several occasions that we are putting together to send for collection at this point. We also had a, a report from Ernie McVean on Cape Elizabeth School Department capital improvement plan for fiscal year 2006 through 2010. This is an initial report which will be folded into the um, budget um, as we move forward, uh, but this was just his particular uh, part of that. And I believe that that was all I wanted to report. I did want to, excuse me, I did want to uh, mention that back in October, the school board did vote to, um, that any student who owed $40 or more in their account would not be allowed to participate in community services, athletics, or co-curricular activities, and would receive a prepackaged bag lunch. Um, I just uh, wanted to remind folks of that, um, and we are continuing with that program. Thank you. The next is the uh, policy subcommittee. Yeah. Policy committee met on January 4th. We discussed a number of items. First on our agenda was the remaining portion of the G policies, which we presented at our last meeting for first reading. And we had very little discussion at our last policy meeting. So we'll be presenting those tonight for second reading. Uh, the next item was policy GAB job descriptions. This is a new policy, um, which we also 
presented last month for first reading and we'll be submitting that for second reading tonight. Third item is the memorial policy that we've been working on and um, the committee's not ready yet to present that. Jeff is going to, has put together a draft and we'll be presenting that to the um, high school crisis response team for feedback before we prepare that for first reading. And then um, the last item under old business was our allergy management policy, which we'll also be presenting later tonight for second reading. And I'd just like to say that that, that that was a policy, for those of you who might not remember or may not have been watching, that was requested by a parent for us to consider. And we um, have had a, quite a large committee and varied committee that have had um, input into developing that policy, which I think has been a great process. Uh, then under new business, we had a request by our school board chair, Kevin Sweeney, uh, for us to consider policy development on protocol for establishing district-wide district committees and school board subcommittees and task forces. Um, we did, our, pol our uh, process for any kind of consideration of new policy as to any requests are brought to the committee. We then discuss whether it's something that we feel we do want to discuss, and then we decide when we're going to be discussing that and what the, what the procedure will be. Um, after kind of tossing some different thoughts around, we determined that we would like the board to adopt a policy regarding board advisory committees. Second to that, we decided that um, as part of that policy, we'd like to have guidelines for um, district-wide, for the establishment of district-wide committees for our entire school district so that there would be guidelines within that first policy. And then finally under that item, we determined that the board does need to in fact review its committee structure and its um, uh, uh, committee appointment uh, structure. And um, we assigned that to the board subcommittee that's going to be working on the B policies, which is board governance. So we'll be taking a look at that. Um, then we moved on to um, continuing our work and reviewing the entire uh, board policy manual. And we uh, began with policy ICAA. We decided that the next section we would work on in the committee is the instruction policy. Policy ICAA is on religious holidays. Um, and uh, we discussed that for, for quite a bit and determined that we actually need three separate policies um, around the various aspects of religious holidays and cultural celebrations in our school. The first is um, to revise a policy ICAA, which we then did work on a draft and will be presented sometime in the next couple months for first reading. Um, we also determined that we probably need a policy around fundraising efforts and how they might re relate to major holidays or cultural celebrations in our community. And um, finally, we thought that we probably need a policy that would address, that will address whether or not to recognize major religious holidays or cultural celebrations in any way and the need for that to be consistent throughout each of our three schools. Um, and I think that that was uh, pretty much it for the committee. Thank you, Ann. Rebecca, Communications Committee. Okay. Um, we discussed a number of things. One was to continue to work on student communication with the school board and vice versa, and I know that one of our communication members was going to be speaking to Jeff about high school student communications to the school board, and we'll be getting that report uh, next week in our next meeting. Um, there was some, com some discussion about asking uh, the school board to try to have agendas made available um, for committee meetings one week before their scheduled meetings so as to provide the public with um, a reasonable amount of advance notice as to the topics that are going to be discussed. Um, we do that, but we don't necessarily do it on a consistent basis, and so um, the committee would just like to ask the board as a whole to try to 
keep that in mind as we move forward through the year. Um, Trish has put together a draft for a school board informational brochure, which I believe all of you received a copy of and an email to ask for your comments. Um, I would ask that you would try to get any back to her by the end of this week, because we will be meeting as a committee next week to discuss this and hopefully get, um, get it to a publication form. And lastly, on our ne this, the meeting for next week, we are going to be starting to talk about committee goals and objectives as in keeping with some of the things that we discussed as school board, school board uh, goals and objectives for this year. The next meeting will be on January 19th, 3.15 at the Pond Cove Media Center. Thank you. And the last is the personnel committee. <clears throat> the primary business of the personnel committee right now is the superintendent search. Um, Kathy, the ads are placed. They are. The ads were placed, <laughs> and the interesting item is that before the ads were ever placed, we had 16 requests for applications, seven um, from the state of Maine, three from New Hampshire, three from Michigan, two from Florida, and one from New York. So despite um, our not having broken the ads, the word is out that Cape Elizabeth is looking for a superintendent. I am told by Bob that we have some very quality um, individuals um, from the state of Maine that have uh, asked for applications. Those of us on the board don't know who those individuals are so that we can be entirely fair and above board during the entire interview process. Um, what we have not done and we need to do is schedule a meeting for sometime before January 28th for the committee as that is the day that applications are are in fact due. And we will continue to provide you with information as we move along. May I ask a question relating to this? Is this the appropriate time? Uh, are we proceeding with getting citizens on the committee? Yeah. What's, what is the deadline for that, for people to? Well, we haven't actually established a deadline, but that's why I want to meet before January 28th. OK. So that we can get that taken care of. I personally, I missed a publication deadline on that. Okay. Any other questions? In that case, we'll move on to unfinished business, which is entirely policy. Um, first item is second readings, as Ann indicated earlier. The, the first policy is policy GAB job descriptions, and I'd like to make, make a motion that we adopt this as presented here in your packet. Do we have a second? second. Henry, thank you. Any questions, comments? In that case, all in favor? Opposed? Passes 7-0. Okay, and then the next few policies are from those remaining G policies at the end of that, and we'll go through those one by one. The first is policy GCQE, enrollment of non-resident employees' children. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt this policy as presented. A second, please. Elaine, thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Opposed? 7-0. Next is policy GCSA, employee computer and internet use. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt this policy as presented. A second. Henry, thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? 7-0. The next item in your packet is um, guidelines, GCSAR, employee community computer and internet use guidelines. I don't think we need to vote on this because they're guidelines. Okay, Just bringing it so. to everybody's attention. The next policy is policy GDO support staff evaluation. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt this policy as presented. Second. Kathy, thank you. Any questions or comments? Elaine? Uh, the um, 
evaluation form is being pulled from that for the recommendation of the council? It's in our yeah, the exhibit behind it? Yeah. Yeah. That's being pulled. When Elaine says counsel, she's referring to our attorneys. Legal counsel, yes. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? 7 0, thank you. Okay, Bob, do we need a vote on, re on removing this exhibit? No. Okay. So that next item is what Elaine was just referring right. to? And the same with the next one, GDOR. That again is a. Not an exhibit, but a, a guideline. Why don't you just state what the guideline is? Can I ask a question Two. about guidelines? <laughs> yeah, go um, ahead. Why doesn't it need a vote? Because guidelines are not set, um, are not policy. They are simply um, the rules that have been set up to go with the policy after the policy was, was established. And who writes the guidelines? I usually superintendent or the administrative group. Okay. And I actually have no issues with the guidelines, but if I did, what would be the avenue to... Just bring them back to the administrative system. The guidelines that are being referred to are GDOR, Administrative Guidelines for Evaluation of Support Staff. Thank you. Okay. And then... The last policy <coughs> that's up for second reading is tonight is um, policy JLCEA, Managing Students with Food Allergies. This is the policy that I referred to earlier when I talked about the um, task force that was compiled of parents, administrators, nurses, and school board members that worked on putting this together. And I was thinking that maybe I would read this. Does that make sense? It's not that long um, to people who haven't had an opportunity. No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the Cape Elizabeth School Department recognizes that food allergies can pose a significant health significant threat to the health of some students. It is the policy of the Cape Elizabeth Schools to work with students, parents, staff, and medical personnel to minimize risks and provide a safe educational environment for food allergic students. As an educational institution, it is the responsibility of the Cape Elizabeth Schools to increase awareness of all students, including their needs, the dangers they face, preventive measures to be taken, signs of allergic reactions, and medical response should a student have an allergic reaction. The schools will also solicit voluntary cooperation from parents, students, and staff toward avoiding food allergic students coming in contact or proximity with foods which cause their particular allergic reactions in school or at school activities. Bans on particular foods by classroom or whole school will not be enacted. School level guidelines will provide details for the implementation of this policy. These guidelines will be reviewed on an annual basis. So at this time, I'd like to make a motion that we adopt this policy as read. Do we have a second? Second. Rebecca, thank you. Um, questions or comments? I guess I just have a question uh, relating to an email that we received. Is it, am I correct in understanding that the, uh, the comments that were made in that email regarding some classroom policies were well are, gu are actually a school guidelines that should be handled at the school level and does not actually involve the board at a policy level now those guidelines were developed by the same task force that developed this policy and the reason why the task force took on the guidelines was because it had and we do have the the right to do that if it's deemed necessary if it just seems as though we need a broader base of people looking at particular guidelines. Um, and so the email that, that you're referring to speaks specifically to a particular guideline. And so in terms of where that discussion would go, you know, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. What do you think, Bob? I mean, that... I'm familiar with the, uh, with the email. With the email. So I think that the committee, it, it just came through this, this afternoon. Um, the committee is still meeting, will be meeting to look at the middle school guidelines and then the high school guidelines. 
and so i suppose would it be appropriate for the committee to take a look at that email and to determine i mean we're we're done with the pond code guidelines but maybe the committee can take a look at that and determine what should happen with it does that make sense bob sure yeah i, th I think okay. it does yeah okay thank you um we need a second on this don't we no i seconded you did Hmm. Need That's vote. right. Yes, we do need a vote. I was absorbed in the conversation. Um, all in favor? 7-0. Thank you. That's, it. That's right. This was supposed to be first. And... That takes care of unfinished business uh, now we move on to new business considerations of the su consideration of the superintendent's recommendation to co-curricular fee positions Bob do you want to sure take care of that um, the first um, series of, of um, positions are in line with drama at the middle school um, we had already appointed the drama director and uh, the sound director um, and the proposal for the allotment of the remaining 150 hours is for Stephen Price <clears throat> to work 50 hours on lighting, Kristen Thomas 50 hours on music, Tom Wilbur 10 hours additional on sound, Evan Solander 20 hours additional on directing, Dory Doughty um, 10 hours on costumes, props, and rehearsals, and Bonnie Steinrotter 10 hours on costumes, props, and rehearsals. In addition, we have three stipend positions at the high school. Uh, Brandy LaPointe for the CAT member, a uh, CAT member. Uh, Katie L Lisa, Liza? Lisa, uh, student leader, and Belinda Snell as student leader. And those are the nominations for this evening. We have a motion, Elaine? I move that we uh, accept the administrators and superintendents' recommendations for co-curricular uh, and stipend positions. Second. Trish, thank you. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? 7-0. The next item on the agenda is consideration of request for child-rearing leave. Uh, in your package is a letter from Holly Swenson um, expressing that she's expecting a baby in March and uh, we'll be asking for a time period um, of approximately um, I don't think it's specific. I, I thought it said 12 weeks, but I think that's something yeah. different. It does say 12 weeks. Okay, 12 weeks. And um, yeah, and uh, part of that will be to, you know, using the amount that her doctor um, recommends will be uh, using her medical, her sick leave, um, and anything beyond that would be unpaid leave. Um, but we do wish her our best and uh, um, to recommend that the grant be, that the leave be granted. Do we have a motion? I move that we approve um, the request from Holly Swenson for child rearing leave. Second, Wayne. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? 7 0. The next item um, may require a little discussion. It's consideration of support for the Yarmouth School Committee letter, which was included in your packet. Bob, if you'd like to explain that, and then I would accept the motion um, so we can discuss the matter. Um, I'll explain it briefly, and then I think we probably should read it as well. Um, I, I received a phone call from the Yarmouth uh, School Superintendent um, mentioning that their board was very concerned about some of the same things we were concerned about, that the uh, 
essential programs and services is not a full funding program. It is a base funding program and doesn't meet. I think we had a question at our workshop with the town council about what isn't included, and it's not a matter of what is or isn't included, it's a matter to what degree it's included. Because um, what they're including in the essential programs and services is enough funding to get kids to that minimum standard of the learning results. They do not include things for many programs in the arts and whatever that we have here in Cape Elizabeth. They do not include funding for um, honors courses, AP courses, <coughs> things that go beyond getting kids to uh, that minimum level. And um, he mentioned that they had drafted a letter and would be um, looking for other signators. And uh, with that, Kevin, shall I read this? Or shall we, did you want to have further discussion? Well, I don't want to discuss it until we have a motion before us and a mm -hmm. seconded motion before us. Um, but I think it would probably be appropriate to read through it. Um, as quickly as you can. So if you want to uh, okay. give it a read, <clears throat> people will know. In November, Maine voters soundly rejected the Pulaski tax cap proposal, sending an unambiguous message to Augusta that tax reform should not be achieved by making across the board cuts in funding for our schools or necessary municipal services. The election results proved once again that Maine citizens wish to preserve the tradition of local control over school and municipal budgets. At the same time, the campaign plainly reinforced a general dissatisfaction with the status quo and energized the effort to achieve equitable tax reform in Maine. Governor Baldacci has jump-started the debate with the introduction of LD number one that in its current form would, one, gradually increase the state share of the cost of education, Two, cap government spending at all levels. Three, provide tax relief for, for some. And four, make dramatic state-imposed changes in the various budget processes of municipalities and school units. This bill is being considered by the legislature's Joint Select Committee on Property Tax Reform and is targeted for a report out to the legislature on January 14th. And I think we know that it uh, at least came out of committee in the last two days. By way of history, in 1990, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a paragraph. Unfortunately, in the rush to find a solution to the statewide tax issues, the current proposal inappropriately co-ops the essential program and services school funding model and converts it from a need-based funding approach to a cost containment tool. EPS was never intended to be a tool for tax relief, and the effort to use it as one will compromise its intent and do more harm than good. By way of history, in 1996, the legislature directed the Department of Education to develop Maine's learning results, to define the core element of elements of education that apply to each student, quote, without regard to their specific career and academic plans. At the time, DOE acknowledged that every student is expected to achieve goals that are broader than those outlined by the learning results. The learning results were never intended to be a description of a complete educational program. They are instead baseline standards intended to assure that all children in Maine have a common educational experience in the specific identified areas of learning. The legislature then tried to identify the resources necessary to achieve these specific goals. In 2003, after years of study, the legislature endorsed and Governor Baldacci signed legislation to begin implement implementation of EPS as a tool to assure that Maine schools would have, at a minimum, the necessary resources to achieve the learning results. As DOE noted, quote, state funding based on EPS recommendations does not translate into state determination of what services the local school needs to offer or how to offer them. End of quote. For example, it does not include more than a minimum number two year, uh, minimum years, I'm sorry, it does not include more than the minimum two years of foreign language, advanced math or science courses, AP courses, most high school electives, or more than a very basic level of extracurricular activities. 
Many students finished the core requirements of EPS by the end of 10th grade. The model does not cover the bulk of the cost of their education for the remaining two years. Plainly, EPS was intended to establish a benchmark for bringing those schools with inadequate funding up to a certain minimum standard. LD number one turns this intention on its ear. Under LD one, the legislature would, over a four-year period, fund 55% of the baseline EPS model, not of a complete education. Local property taxes would fund the remaining 45%, and any education costs that go beyond the EPS model, all within a specifically set targeted amount. The implicit assumption of LD1 is that EPS establishes the reasonable cost of a complete educational program for students, and the explicit provisions would make it nearly impossible for those communities currently spending more than the EPS baseline to continue to provide adequate funding for their schools. In other words, instead of bringing the school spending less than EPS up to the minimum LD, LD number one is intended to bring those spending more down to the minimum. Studies have shown that Maine students graduate from high school in record numbers. However, the studies also show that they go on to college or stay in college at a low rate, which in turn is a factor in our inability to build Maine's economy. While setting a baseline standard for all is critical, Affecting tax relief by lowering the overall standards exacerbates the problem we face for the future of our state. As school committee members, we are prepared to engage our communities in meaningful dialogue, debate, and compromise over our budgets. It is arguable that EPS presents an excellent starting point for that dialogue. Using EPS as a spending cap, however, sends a message that a baseline education is good enough for all and improperly inserts the state in local budget issues. We believe that this approach is wrong. I would entertain a motion authorizing the superintendent to author on our behalf's behalf a, uh, a letter stating the same basic uh, principles as regards uh, to the State Commissioner of Education. Do I have a motion? Can I ask a question? Do I need to make a motion? I think we probably need to make a motion and then get into, have it seconded and get into questions I'll and discussion. The, I'll second the motion. What well, hasn't been moved yet? Can you just move it? I'll move it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I was just suggesting that I would entertain something along those lines. Yeah, I, it's okay. funny to get the discussion going. So we have a motion made and seconded, and now we can uh, discuss this. Was the Yarmouth School Committee looking for our <coughs> co-signature on this or encouraging or suggesting or inviting us to write our own? I think they were um, seeking co-signers for the letter. This letter. So that would be a different motion. That would be different then. It, it, I was under the impression they were seeking a letter from us. That wasn't my understanding, Kevin. So is their intent then, if they get co signatures from school committees and school boards throughout Maine, yep. throughout the entire state of Maine, they would then submit that to the legislature? That's to the governor? Understand. Okay. Well, we I, could withdraw no. the motion. Yes, let's or do that. Yes. I'd like to move that we uh, change the motion to uh, authorize the superintendent to um, add Cape Elizabeth School Board as a signer with the Yarmouth School Committee uh, regarding the content of this letter. Second. Second. Trish, thank you. Further discussion? Is it only Susan Gendron who is going to receive this, or is this going to the tax committee uh, that's currently doing that work? To all, to all the various people that would be involved in this. And will it, I mean, in 
theory, it's almost an editorial. Can it be go to all, all the newspapers in the? We could send it to anyone you'd like to have it sent to. Um, I don't know what their intent is on that. But if we're co-authoring, then we need to do it collaboratively, don't we? Like, we can't just send it to the Portland Press Held, even if we co-sign it. I think that that will be worked out. I don't see a problem with that. I mean, I, I think that's a great question. I think yep. it's, it's very useful information yep. to the general public. And, and I think all school districts are facing some of the same decisions that we are. And to let people know what's going on is, is part of our role. Uh, well, I can um, ask to have it considered as an open letter and you know, distributed to. Just a suggestion, my sure. support of it isn't predisposed on that, but I think the we'll more widely, care. I think Elaine's yeah. question was very, uh, the more widely the information is shared. The, uh, just as a point of information, during the Pileski issue, the Yarm School Committee was quite free in allowing us the use of their materials and we allowed them the use of our materials. And there were also quite a few other school districts involved in that. So I, I see no particular issue with that unless it becomes an issue. Consider it done. That brings us almost to a conclusion. And I have to vote. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I guess um, um, my only other comment would be for this letter is it's a little vague at the end as to what they would hope to be achieved. Um, and maybe that could be a follow-up letter. But I would suggest that maybe we would need to take it to the next step and say we hope that you would you know, make the following adjustments to whatever L, you know, whatever law or committee report or whatever, but to be very specific, to not just leave it as, as nebulous as it is at the end. Um, so in our communication, if, if we decide as a board to endorse this, if we could um, communicate to Yarmouth that maybe another follow-up letter would be appropriate. Any other comments or questions? Must be nine o'clock. Thank you. Henry. Um, in that case, uh, we'll close the discussion. All those in favor? Opposed? Seven zero. Go ahead, Bob. Um, and if uh, fail to put the yes, I was just going to. <clears throat> there are two items that we forgot to put on the agenda again. The first is there is now an opportunity for public comment on items that are not on the agenda. Is there anyone here who'd like to make public comment? No, that takes care of that. The other item that has been missing from our agenda has been other board members' opportunity to request an agenda item or appeal a decision of the leadership committee on a, an agenda item we have anyone who'd like to take advantage of that? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to close the business with this evening. You want to read the, the upcoming meeting? Somebody can do that. <laughs> Somebody needs to take that over for me because I seem to forget that every month. <laughs> upcoming meetings. Um, communication committee will be meeting on Wednesday, January 19th. 3.15 p.m. Pond Cove Media Center. School Board Workshop, Tuesday, January 25th, 2005. High School Library at 7 p.m. This is an executive session. It's the superintendent's mid-year evaluation. Um, please cite in the future the particular portion of the law that says we're doing this because I think we're required to do that. Um, and when that meeting is posted, um, please include that citation. Um, we need to be careful with that. Uh, the policy subcommittee, uh, school board committee members only. Thursday, January 20th at 2005, superintendent's office, 
nine thirty a m topic review of policies and section b of policy manual as a point of clarification i think it's still open to the public but it's saying that um district leadership does not need to be there at that meeting i'm glad you clarified that thank you um school board training workshop um Friday, January 28th, 2005, William H. Jordan Conference Room at 9 a.m. Topic, negotiation training. School Board Policy Subcommittee, Tuesday, February 1st, 2005, at noon in the William H. Jordan Conference Room. Finance Subcommittee Meeting, February 28th, 7 p.m., William H. Jordan Conference Room. February 8th. February 8th. Did I say 20th? <laughs> yeah, well, if only I could. Followed by the regular school board meeting at 7.30 in the council chambers. And do I actually need a motion to adjourn or can I just do that? Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved, yeah. Thank you, Elaine. A second. All in favor? Uh, Seven zero. Thank you very much. Good night, all.